Joe received his PhD from Brown University in 1993 and did his postdoc at Caltech between 93 and 95 and joined the faculty of uh, uh, Georgia Tech afterwards. His research focused on mechanical behavior at multiple lens scale, emphasizing multi scale, multi physics simulations and experiments. Uh, he is the George Woodrow Professor at the School of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science Engineering. He was a world-class university professor uh, by the National Research Foundation of Korea. He is a fellow of ASME and has served as editor or associate editor for several journals. Um, without further ado, let's uh, welcome Professor Joe. Uh, thank you, Yong, for the introduction, and thank you, uh, MJ, for the uh, invitation. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be on your campus, and I believe this is my first time. So, and so far it's been great. You, you know, I love your campus much better than our cramped Georgia Tech campus. But our campus is beautiful also, but it's it's cramped because we're in the in the in the middle of the city. We don't have nearly as much space. Uh, <clears throat> what I want to talk about today is uh, actually some of the things we've been doing uh, with with my student. Uh, Jay at Georgia Tech, but in collaboration with a couple of people, the, the group of Dr. Groven at uh, South Dakota School of Mines, and then with the group of uh, Steve Sang, Dr. Steve Sang at Purdue. Uh, we actually work on energetic materials, but today I will try to stay as much possible uh, as uh, away from energetic materials, which are like propellants, high explosives, things that have chemical reactions that release energy. Uh, I will focus on the mechanical, the electrical effects, and then the microstructure effects. So we mechanics people can enjoy and then appreciate more. I want to focus on how the electrical process can couple with mechanical and thermal process to influence material properties at the microstructure level. Um, but first, I wanted to kind of just briefly review some, some effects, some physical effects. The primary effects are the piezoelectric effect and then the flexoelectric effect. The, we probably know a little bit more about piezoelectricity than we know about flexoelectricity. Um, <clears throat> the uh, piezoelectricity is actually is only in materials that have, that is non-central symmetric, meaning that the lattices are such that the positive charge, the, the center of the positive charge and the center of negative charge are not on top of each other. So if you apply a stress, uniform stress or uniform strength, then the lattice stretch uh, this, the, the, uh, changes and then the, the two charges or the centers of charges will move relative to each other, you have a polarization or electrical displacement. 
So stress or strain induces electrical output. And the next piezoelectricity. So the the, the piezoelectricity uh, would would be would be the first part, right? The stress would would give you a uh, polarizers, and that's the direct effect. Now the and then you have the converse effect is that for piezoelectric materials, if you have an electric field, then you can also have a mechanical deformation strain that would give you stress. Right? That's the piezoelectricity. Um, flexoelectricity is a little bit different. Flexoelectricity can exist in central symmetric materials as well as non central symmetric materials, meaning that the charges. The positive charge and negative charges, their centers could actually be on top of each other, you can still have that effect. And it's primarily that when you apply an non-uniform strain or stress, such that you have a strain gradient. So if, if you distort the lattice, uh, I can not see the screen as well. I think I can, yeah, the, 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 it's right here. If you, if you have a non-uniform deformation, you can actually separate the positive charge center and the negative charge center. You have a, a displacement. So it's the displaced string gradient that would produce a, an output. Or on the other hand, if you have an electric field gradient, if the e field, electric field is non-uniform, having a gradient, you can have a string or stress output. Um, so these are totally two different mechanisms, but uh, flexoelectricity exists in more materials. Uh, actually, it's more common, even though at least, you know, in, as a mechanics person, I've heard much less of it so far. Um, piezoelectricity, we know that. Piezoelectric mater uh, materials are used for transducers and many other things. And flexoelectricity is primarily used for energy harvesting, for example. If you have it on a beam, bending beam, and if just simple, you, you flex it, you have string gradient. Then if you just put an electrode on the upper surface and then the, and another electrode on the lower surface, when you flex it, you can get an electrical output. You can, through vibration, you can harvest energy. And that's the macroscopic effect. Um, we wanted, the reason we came, up, uh, came into working on these problems is actually there are several issues. The first issue is that, is that we found that microstructure, when you change the microstructure, meaning like for a composite material, uh, you change both the piezoelectricity and the flexoelectricity quite a bit. That's really my focus. So, so and then that's where, actually, that's less understood. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And the second thing is that the, I also wanted to mention that we, we, we mechanics people, we work on the string gradient theory in plasticity, right? You, you, many of you probably are doing research and a lot, a lot of uh, my colleagues here actually have uh, are leaders in that area on, on uh, string gradient plasticity. So, so this is kind of similar, but it's linear. And the, 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 the difference is that the flexoelectric tensor that relates the string gradient and the electric output is a fourth order tensor. And it's very complicated, right? So how do you measure those? If it's fully anisotropic, you have 81 constants because you have four components. That's a lot, that's very difficult to do. Even for isotropic materials, isotropic tensors, for those of you who are taking continuum mechanics, you know that isotropic fourth order tensors have only up to three independent constants, just like the linear elastic modulus. For isotropic materials, actually it can boil down to ultimately two independent constants, the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio. So it turns out for flexoelectricity, this tensor actually works out to be only two parameters also. But even then, they are still very difficult to measure. So we wanted to use computations and in combination with the experiments to understand how we can back out this tensor. And then lastly, since I work primarily on energetic materials, then I wanted to also see that how these, these two phenomena, piezoelectricity, flexoelectricity, couple, and the influence macroscopic behavior of materials such as ignition, initiation of chemistry, or, or, or affects what happens uh, in the microstructure. 
Um, the first material I wanted to I want to talk about is actually a polymer aluminum particle composite. It has the, these particles embedded in, in a polymer, a, a tur polymer. A tur polymer would be uh, uh, made up of three monomers. It's just, you, know, you have three types of uh, polymer elements in the, uh, the, the, the THV. THV is the tur polymer. And you embed aluminum particles, and the polymer is actually flexoelectric. It's, it does not have piezoelectricity in this in the first part, and that I'm going to cover. But it has flexoelectricity. The metal, metal, metal is just elastic plastic. It does not have any piezo or flexoelectricity. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Groven's group uh, measured made these materials. And then they measured the, the using the flex of the, the, the flex experiment, beam bending experiment, and measured the the, the flexoelectric constant, primarily the shear, the overall constant. They found that the amount of aluminum in the material has a significant impact of how much electrical output you can get. And the question is why? and why it has to be like that. And that's, that's question number one. Number two, that is that we now know that for isotropic flexoelectric materials, the, 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 the fourth order tensor looks very much like the linear elastic uh, constitutive, the, the stiffness tensor with two independent constants. Those two constants are the shear coefficient that's involved in the gradient of the shear strength, like epsilon one two or epsilon two one, for example, but but come on, you know, the gradient, not not just the the string itself, it's the gradient, and then the transverse transverse would mean that the the if you have normal stress or string in the horizontal direction, then it's the gradient of that string in the y direction, in the perpendicular direction, that affects the output. So it only boils down to those two constants. But even those two constants for such a simple case, um, when you use a bending experiment, it, they are still coupled, meaning that the, both components, both of those will com contribute to give you the, the apparent electrical output. And it's, it's not possible to separate them from purely just the experiment. Because if, even if you do a bending experiment, you will have the two uh, string, com uh, string gradient components. Uh, it's not possible to just have one. So, so we wanted to be able to separate that from um, uh, simulations computations. Now, I also want to mention that actually uh, you have three, even for isotropic materials, you have three constants, the transverse, the shear, and the longitudinal, but the longitudinal and uh, the three are related through a relationship. So you, if you know any two, which is what I did here, then you can know the third. So I simplified it into this form. So with that in mind, then uh, I wanted to see how microstructure comes in to influence the amount of, this coefficient basically measures for uh, per unit string gradient, per unit bending, how much electrical output you're going to get through flexoelectricity. So I wanted to, I want to do that. Um, this is just briefly, you know, I don't want to go into the details, but this is just to, to impress upon you that actually doing experiments is not easy. And uh, people come up with all kinds of configurations to measure just those two constants, even for the isotropic materials. Um, and even so, quite often they are coupled. Now, then for anisotropic materials, then people come up with many, several ingenious ways to measure and several of those constants, which I'm not gonna go into details, but, but, but you, it's very hard to get all of them. So obviously computations can, can come in to help. All right, so that's the point. If, if any of you have been doing work in this regard, then you probably know what I'm talking about. But if you have not been doing things in this regard, then the only point I want to, I want to deliver here with this slide is uh, it's hard experimentally to measure them. Um, 
The second thing that I want, in the topic, or second material system that I want to talk about is uh, a, an, again, a, a PVDF uh, TR, uh, TRFE uh, nano-aluminum composite. This is actually a propellant material. Uh, you, people use these materials in, in rockets, possibly, as solid fuels, that sort of things. And they, in the, aluminum is actually carries a lot of energy. Aluminum, when it burns, when it reacts with oxygen or some other elements, uh, 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 can, can release quite a lot of energy. So that's why people use aluminum polymer composites. Now, uh, the group of Steve Sung at, at, at Purdue, what they did is that they made these materials, and then they impact, they, they impacted. And then this is what they, what they observe. They basically, this is, I hope I, oh, I, th I think the movie is playing. You can see that at some point as they, they, they compress on the, on the sample, uh, you, can have a, you can have a cloud that spools up. That's chemical reaction. Meaning you apply a, uh, and a mechanical force stress, and then at some point you, can have, you have the initiation of chemistry. The question is how? Why, what, what happens that? Is it because you, 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 you have a lot of plasticity that increases the temperature? Or it's actually electrically driven, it's electromechanical. And they, they measure the timing also. So they measure that this is how much loading you apply, and then the time at which it takes for you to observe that reaction. And it, of course, the time shortens if you hit it harder, if you provide more energy or stress to the material. So, so why is that? And, and they, they do the experiments, and we wanted to actually also analyze why and how the piezoelectricity and flexoelectricity uh, play the role of causing what we, uh, what, we, what we have. So those are the two issues that I wanted to, I wanted to study. And then the first one. Uh, how microstructure, how you can manipulate to the microstructure. This is just a composite, right? Aluminum embedded in uh, a uh, ter polymer. And these larger circles are just voids. You actually have voids. And voids actually indeed play a positive role, actually helps you in this. Both actually aluminum particles and then the, the void help you to get more electrical output. So, so this is the model material that, that they're, they're studying in South Dakota, and this is what they what, what the material looks like. I don't. I'm not going to go through the detailed microstructure parameters and size scales, but the point is, um, how can you manipulate systematically the amount of voids, the amount of aluminum in the microstructure, and then achieve the electrical output that you desire, and why, and what we is that, well, of course, we do the microstructure explicit simulations. And in the last few years, we developed this idea of using what we call statistically equivalent microstructure sample sets. You can see that the, you, many of you will immediately say, well, the microstructure is very random, right? Why did you put the particle here, particle there, and like that? That's very random. And each one of them would be different from another, any other. So there is statistical variation. And what we do is that we generate, randomly generate a set of multiple samples that statistically are similar or equivalent to each other. So we can get an uncertainty uh, quantification also. We can, we, we can know the fluctuation. Just like experimentalists, when you do experiments, you use multiple samples, you get the statistical quantification as well. So we do that uh, computationally. Um, it turns out that you're going to have to work on a couple of things, right? Uh, you, the, the problem is electromechanical coupled. You apply mechanical stress, piezoelectricity, flexoelectricity produce charge or, uh, or, or electrical output. And then the electrical output can change the stress and strength. So the electrical process and Mechanical process are coupled. Now, the electric process, this is an electrical static because 
mechanical deformation, that's the balance of momentum, that's the, basically the equilibrium equation. S is, F is the deformation gradient, S is the second pure Kirchhoff stress uh, in continuum mechanics. And that's the equilibrium. And the electrical equations are conservation of charge, uh, Coulomb's law, conservation, conservation of charge, meaning the divergence of the E field, the electric field must be equal to zero. And then the, uh, the, the electric field must be curl free under static conditions. That's Faraday's law. Um, and I will come back to point out to the more general version because we, we are going to involve dynamics as well. And the electric output that has to do with with the, the, the dielectric response, and then the flexical, uh, flexoelectric output, and then the stress-strain relations, right? The, the mechanical part, the, 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 the linear elasticity, and then the electrical uh, uh, part also, the flexo flexoelectricity. The E-field comes back to influence the, uh, the behavior. Right? The E-field gradient, actually, would influence the stress as well there. So they are fully coupled. And then, of course, finite deformation. That's the, the Lagrangian string that we continue me mechanics people we, we are very familiar with. And then the elasticity constants. And then the flexoelectric fourth order tensor, you, you can see that they are very similar. Right? So um, we couple all that. But before I, I move on, I wanted to kind of show the general electrodynamic equations also, because we're going to use it later on. And for, for you grad students, you remember in college physics, we learned about the, the Maxwell equations. And for so many years, I have not had to think about them. So, so a couple years ago, when we started working on these problems, I had to refresh my memory. And basically, the Maxwell equation says that anytime you have a change in E field, then you always have magnetic field coupled. And then there are four equations that says that the E field and the magnetic field are coupled. You have Coulomb's law that says conservation of charge. And then uh, Coulomb's law for, for magnetism, that means that it says there is, no, there is no magnetic monopole. There is no such a thing as magnetic charge. It's always, uh, uh, the magnetic field is always bipolar. You always have two poles. And then, of course, Faraday's law of induction, that means that the E field is related to the rate of change of the magnetic field, and then, of course, the magnetic field is related to the current, both the current and then the displacement change. This is, uh, uh, Maxwell calls this the, the, the electric displacement current. E field changes can cause that also. So they are fully coupled. And then later on, when I talk about the, the, the dynamic aspect, we're actually going to solve this. But for the static case, then of course it's, you know, it's just primarily the, the top two that will uh, top actually this one, and then in a special case of this one that will govern. Um, so we set up this, and then we, as mechanics people, then we we just do the mechanical bending. Right? We apply a pure bending moment for a homogeneous material. This is what you see that you have the electric output right between the upper surface and lower surface. And so if you have an electrode here and an electrode here, you're going to get the flexoelectric output. That's purely because of the flexoelectricity. But when you have microstructure, see, the fields are so heterogeneous. The particles and the voids influence make things very non-uniform. But the effective flexoelectric output, it's effectively how much charge or electricity you can get out of the material from this by the from the same amount of deformation is measured by this coefficient. Basically, it says that you have you have not only just the uh, the, the regular shear component, you also have the other two components, the long, longitudinal strain. Because for pure bending, you only have this strain, no, the the uh, the longitudinal strain in this the gradient in the vertical direction. And you have, and then Poisson's ratio says for this longitudinal strain you have a gradient also, but because you generate the, there is no shear here for pure bending, but because of the microstructure you have shear, so you actually have total free contrib contributions, but you are also by having the voids and then the metals, the metals are not flexoelectric, the voids produce is empty, they don't have flexoelectricity, even though. 
you buy, you have less volume of the flexoelectric capable material, but you actually force the rest of the material to give you more output because of higher stresses, higher strengths, and then the activation of strength gradients in other ways. So, so in a nutshell, then you have this magnification, uh, this, 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 this coefficient that's magnified. And I will just show you some quick pictures of, again, for, for microstructure cases, different string components. And then you have three components in two directions. You have six different string gradients. And all those you have to be included and characterized. And so here is the outcome, right? That's what the overall microstructure will give you in terms of the output. And it turns out that if we use the base shear string as the baseline, we, we can see that the shear string, uh, the, the, oh, I'm sorry, the longitude in the lower string, the horizontal string gradient in the vertical direction, uh, that as the baseline. And it's, with, for the microstructure case, it's only 66%, only two thirds, about two thirds. You actually can enhance it by, from the shear, which didn't exist if you didn't have the microstructure or the longitudinal in the vertical direction, the other string gradient component can give you another 9% to 10%. So that's how you get the enhancement. Now with different amount of aluminum, the, the contributions of the three parts changes. The baseline string gradient actually decreases as you have more and more heterogeneities. Uh, more aluminum, for example, then the, the baseline string gradient has less and less uh, decreasing, less effect. And then the other components can increase, primarily the shear. You induce more shear. And then the longitudinal also decreases a little bit, but you enhance the, the shear contribution. And that's just a few random samples. We have the arrow bar here. And that's because for each case, then we have random, random microstructure samples like I just mentioned earlier. Right. So you get the uncertainty of quantification. Now, here is what computations can do that experiments cannot. That is that, how do you figure out the flexoelectric coefficients, the contributions that you cannot measure experimentally? How, how do you separate them? And experimentally, they can only measure, they can use different amount of aluminum and measure the output. And so those are the experimental data points. So computationally, what we can do is to systematically analyze the ratio between the flexoelectric uh, coefficients, how much each gradient would contribute. We can systematically do that. And what we found is that they must have this ratio. They must have roughly this ratio, 0.625 with the negative sign, that would really explain the experimental trend. And this is something that experiments cannot do, but computations can do. So, so using the microstructure simulations, we can back out individual coefficients that can be used then to do more systematic simulations. Um, um, how about porosity? We, we, we talked about uh, how, how are we doing in terms of time. Okay. Uh, um, we talked about alum, uh, amount of aluminum particles, the solids. How about uh, uh, porosity? And this has no, no pores, no, no voids. And this is about 10% voids. Obviously, the voids allow you to significantly enhance it. Without voids, the enhancement in the, the electrical output is less. So when you have voids, then you match the experiment also that would, uh, would increase the enhancement. That's the that's, that's how much, right? That's relative to the homogeneous material, pure material, how much output you, in terms of ratios you can get out. So voids are important as well. Heterogeneities are, are just both. Any type of heterogeneities help with the phenomenon. Uh, particle size. 
just quickly say that if you increase the particle size, you actually have less electrical output. So smaller is better in this case. We just randomly, for, for without voids, so we're not trying to match the experiment, but just to purely explore the trend, smaller is better if you wanted more electrical output for the same amount of deformation, same amount of bending. Now, let me, uh, let me now uh, switch gear and talk about how piezoelectricity and flexoelectricity can be combined to, to do things, to control, uh, for example, the ac activation of chemistry. For energetic materials, this is actually for, for the um, uh, PVDF, TRFE uh, compo uh, aluminum composite that I mentioned earlier. Uh, energetic materials like, uh, are typically used in like uh, mining, demolition, airbags, of course, munition, and because you want to have chemical energy release. Now, the, the, the historic way of, in, uh, of activating the reaction is by applying a mechanical force. You impact it, you, you apply the mechanical pulse, and then mechanical deformation generates plasticity, generate, has friction that causes the so-called hot spots, the red spots there, are high temperature areas where chemical reaction will initiate. Um, the desire to go away from the mechanical loading, mechanical loading sometimes are hard to, to achieve. Uh, electrical input sometimes can be better controlled. So there's a desire to actually use elect electrical impulse to cause that, so the electrical effect is important. So what we are trying to do is to analyze that. And electrically, how do you cause the temperature increase? You, call, you, you, you produce E-field, and then when the electric field is strong enough, you may have dielectric breakdown. You may have sparking in the material. That causes the material to be made conductive. The current flows in the material in very local areas, and the current converts the electrical energy into thermal energy, generating the temperature. So that's what we're going to do here to see that once you have enough E field, electric field in the material, you have dielectric breakdown, and you generate hot spots, very high temperatures, they will initiate the chemistry. So that's what, what we want to do here. And this is the experiments are what I just I showed you previously at the beginning. Right? You, you apply the mechanical force, but, but the stress generates E-field in the material through um, piezoelectricity, flexoelectricity. So again, the material model is, 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 is what I talked about already. We have the aluminum particles, we have the polymer, and we have our model that is just uh, pretty similar to what we, we have. But, the, but there is also a... Uh, aluminum oxide layer around each particle. Aluminum is very chemically active. Pure aluminum doesn't exist in, in air. It always it has an oxidized layer. So that has to be considered as well. We, we, uh, I'm not gonna go into the details. But first is, some people might automatically think, if you apply a mechanical loading, maybe you're generating a lot of plasticity or viscoelasticity, that gives you the temperature increase. And we did central simulations to show that uh, there is very little, little temperature increase due to viscoelasticity or, or viscoplasticity from the material. It's not mechanically driven, it's electrically driven, the point is. So uh, here is what actually happens. When you apply the mechanical loading, and at some point you have the chemistry there, and you actually have two processes. The first is that when you apply mechanical loading, the stress generates E-field through piezoelectricity and flexoelectricity, so you have E-field uh, generation, charge generation in the material. And at some point, so th this is actually for, for both Piezoelectricity has to be pulled. You, for the material, for PVDF, you apply a voltage, you induce a polarization. That's how you can have piezoelectricity. So we have two versions. We have pulled materials and unpulled materials. Unpulled materials has both piezoelectricity and flexo. 
electricity. Unpolluted has only flex on. So it gives us a way to separate those two, right? So, so we have all those. And under mechanical loading, you first develop the E-field. As you can see, that the E-field is heavily concentrated around the particles because that's where you have high stress and high spin gradient. Then if, when the E-field is strong enough at some point, then you have dielectric breakdown. The E-field causes local areas of the material to be conductive to have current, that's a very fast process. You, you are talking about hundreds or over 100 microseconds for the mechanical process, mechanically driven electrical process. But for the dielectric breakdown process, there is not too much happening mechanically, and it happens in nanoseconds. You can see that the E field, the electric field gets dissipated and the temperature increases. So the electric energy stored in the material is converted into the thermal energy. That's how you get to the temperature increase. Uh, quickly to point out to the governing equations here, uh, actually, uh, let me see, uh, in the, in the electro, electromechanical part, uh, it's still the same equations that I talked about previously. The electro process is very fast, so it's almost equilibrium, that's the mechanical process. We still have the same set of equations, except that in this case, we have the Piaggio electricity as well. Right? Same set of equations. Now, during breakdown, then it's the, 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 the electrical process is very fast, so we have to use the, 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 the four Maxwell equations. And then you have a breakdown model as well, in the sense that initially the material is not conductive, the polymer is not conductive. Only the polymer goes breakdown, by the way. The metal does not. Uh, so the polymer initially is dielectric, is not conductive, and so we have a model that says that if the E field is within a certain level, if the E field is small enough, the material has very low conductivity. By the way, the, the theory says that even for dielectric materials, you have a very small amount of conductivity. Right? It's so low that it's probably practically undetectable. So, so practically, you have a very low conductivity initially, but then if the E field is strong enough, then the material uh, breaks down and you have sparking in the material and then the conductivity increases and then you have suddenly high conductivity and you have a lot of current. That's how you get the heat. Okay? So, so we have to build all that in there. It's kind of like you know maybe fracture, material failure type of things in the in the in the traditional mechanics sense. Um, we have to because it's a viscoelastic material. Then we have to consider the material the, the loading stops and then material bounces back, and so that simulation allows to capture for each load intensity for each load intensity how much each a given set amount of energy input. What is the maximum strain we can achieve? We did that. This is a this is a standard viscoelastic calculation that we carry out, and then here is what happens. Uh, you have uh, the different string components at different times. Uh, as as we deform, we can see that the electric E field intensifies. I think this is a this is a. This is a pole material, so this has piezo electricity as well. Has piezo electricity and, and flexo electricity. The difference between the pie, the, the pole and unpoled material is that the piezo electricity gives you an overall potential difference, voltage difference between the top and the bottom surface. The unpoled material practically has no macroscopic uh, voltage difference or potential difference. Uh, but but again, it's the local areas with the highest E field that dominates. So, so flexo electricity dominates the local high E field areas around the particles, such that even though the E field distributions look different from, quite different from these two materials, but their overall behavior is not extremely different. They are only 20% different, as, as, as I will show. Um, <clears throat> So this is a detailed look at it. The E field, the horizontal component, the vertical component, the magnitude, pole and unpole. Uh, horizontal is pretty much the same. 
Vertical is different because of the piezoelectric polarization is in the vertical direction. And then the overall E field is different. But again, locally around the particles, uh, even just with just pure flexible electricity, the E field can be very high. That's, that's where you have the problem or you can, you can take advantage of the effects. Uh, this is not too novel in the sense that we, we mechanics people, we know that you have a heterogeneous material, then again, you have heterogeneous strings. You have the heterogeneous string gradients also, and they all come in to, uh, to contribute to influence in the electrical fields, electric fields. And I think these are movies. So you apply the mechanical loading, you, you accumulate the strain, you accumulate the E field. Uh, initially, as the strain and an E field develops, there is no temperature until breakdown happens. Once the E field is strong enough, you have breakdown, and then the current flows very quickly within nanoseconds, and temperature increases very high to the point that you can have melting, you can have um, uh, uh, chemical reaction. And melting is, is, is modeled as well, by the way. I, I, I think I had it in the slides, I just didn't mention it. So here is what happens. You have to reach a threshold of E-field intensity for the breakdown to happen. But once it begins to happen, this is just three nanoseconds, eight nanoseconds later, you can see that the E-field decreases because the electrical energy is, is lost, is converted into heat. You have rapid temperature increase. You have the so-called hot spots that causes the melting. Uh, um, that causes this, uh, the melting. And then, of course, temperature increases and then the rea initiation of reaction. Now, the conductivity, this is initially, before breakdown, there is no conductivity. There is no areas that's conductive, but the breakdown causes conduction to occur. So they use, those are the areas that have become conductive. But once they become conductive, they have heat, the current flow, and then the temperature increase spreads into other areas also, and then cause melting, even go, going beyond the areas that have broken down. So that all is, is tracked. And this is just says how quickly things happen, right? This is nanoseconds. Once the breakdown begins, uh, the, the current initially is really high and then gradually decreases. The E field is very high and then gradually dissipates. And the temperature increases rapidly and then eventually reaches a plateau. And it all depends on uh, how much energy is stored, e electrical energy is stored in the material. Um, we do systematic quantifications in the microstructure. The key is around the aluminum particles, because aluminum reacts with the polymer, what is the temperature increase? So we color each particle by the interfacial temperature, and we wanted to do statistical analysis. We do all that. And then we say that how much of the particles or the microstructure is hot enough, is, has been heated enough to reach chemical reaction. And then we can calculate that threshold. The wind, how much time do we need to apply mechanical loading? And we can calculate that and then for multiple different samples, then we can calculate the statistical difference as well. And I would just say that for different levels of required heating, then of course the predicted uh, ignition curve, heating curve is a little bit different. So 2% is roughly right. You roughly need about 2% of the particles to be heated enough to, to get things going. It, it, it turns out. You don't need a lot, actually. Once it happens, once chemical energy begins to be released, then things can happen very quickly. And a comparison between experiments and simulations uh, is actually quite favorable. You, you can capture the experimental trends very well. So, so indeed, it's, it's actually electrically driven through both piezo and electric uh, flexo. And then for both, both, both unpoled and poled materials, poled materials, again, has both piezoelectricity and flexoelectricity 
Of course, that it makes things happen earlier, but the difference is only about 20%. So the unload can, ha can almost happen as easily, and that means that flexoelectricity dominates. Piezoelectricity only helps by about 20%. Um, the only last slide I wanted to show now is if you keep increasing the aluminum particles, you keep increasing heterogeneity, you can actually enhance the ability, meaning that if you only have 5% particles, then things happen slower, more slowly. But if you increase the particles to about 13%, then you can make things happen, the threshold happen much earlier, things much faster. So, so having more aluminum, having more energy for chemistry anyway also helps with getting the getting the chemistry going more quickly for both pod and unpod materials. All right. Uh, here is the summary slide. I think we are pretty much out of time, so I will stop here and uh, and I will just let you see the slides because we covered most of the points. I'm not going to go through the them again. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice slide. We're open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Um, I have two questions. The okay. first one is how do you describe the particle interactions? And then the second question is um, since your microstructure is about 100 micron. How did you relate it to your experimental result? <clears throat> how do I, the first question, how do I Particle interaction. In, uh, uh, describe the particle interactions? Well, mechanically, the particles are stiffer, the polymer is softer, the voids, you know, they, uh, are empty. So it's, it's the stiffness, right? So mechanical interaction is purely just inhomogeneous uh, material response. The, 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 the interface is perfectly bounded, right? Mechanical interaction is purely just the constitutive behavior difference. Electrically, uh, dielectric response is different. Conductivity is different. Um, <clears throat> and when breakdown happens then, that changes the dielectric behavior, the conductive behavior also, only for the polypolymer. So, so that totally influences how the E field is propagated, magnetic field is, is spread, or current is flowing in the material. So electrically, uh, all that heterogeneities affect the electrical process. I don't know whether that answers your question in terms of the interaction or not. Did you use phase field or finite element? Uh, this is finite element, but we do not use phase field. This is fully dynamically, uh, physically resolved. So it's purely the full mechanical process of deformation, equilibrium, stress spin behavior, and the electrically, the full Maxwell equations that we solve, uh, we, do not, we have not used phase field. Okay. Second is, I'm sorry, I forgot. Computational size versus oh, oh, yes. The In general, for mechanics people, what we say is the, the sample size, in order to have a representative volume element, the, the, the sample size has to be at least 10 times or higher the size of the characteristic heterogeneity. So we have roughly, I, well, for the particles, we have much more than 10 times, right? So I believe we have a representative enough uh, volume element, number one. Number two, there is still uncertainty there, fluctuations. There is still the question of your sample size is large enough or not. So, so that's where our microstructure sample sets, random sample sets come in, right? Now, Loading condition, of course, we scale the loading. We ensure that the amount of deformation we get for the particular microstructure model is captures what is in the actual material. So that's how we relate uh, the, the smaller model to the larger sample. 
right? It's by the amount of energy input per unit volume. In, in a way, that's how we do it. Well, thank you for the questions. Yeah. Yeah, just quick questions, a very nice talk. So, uh, so I'm curious about the velocity or the voice, right? You call the voice. So, say for the same um, volume ratio of the voice, but uh, now I can tune the padding of the voice because you know that the voice different locations, right? So how how this gonna be you know affect all the you know the results you know electrically and also the breakdown all this. Positions of the voids or particles, for that matter, yeah, yeah. they cannot be controlled. Cannot I mean, you know, when you make these materials, they happen, they are random. Oh. Right? So, locally, it matters a lot yet for a particular point. But if you talk about a larger enough area, right, then it's the aggregate behavior that matters. Uh, still, though, when you change their locations, the overall behavior will, will change a little bit, right? Yeah. So my idea of handling it is, again, like we use, we don't know. We know that each random, what we call, people call instantiation, each random realization is going to give you a slightly different result, right? There is nothing I can control. Nobody can control. So what the... The way we handle that is, I'm going to analyze the enough number of those random samples. So I know the range. That's why the slides, you know, in general have 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 the arrow bars. I'll come, I'll come back to this. For example, I have arrow bars. The arrow bars are relatively small. So your sample is large enough, and you 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 have a representative enough large sample. Uh, but still, each sample is different, so you, you, all you can say is, I have this range. So that's what we are saying. Uh, maybe, you know, there are, there are better ideas of handling that. But, but it's one way that we have developed to do it. Actually, we use this approach to, de so, so with this, so I know the statistic distribution of the range of the behavior now. Actually, for other uh, efforts, we actually use the, the statistical distribution data to develop a probabilistic characterization. So instead of saying, aha, uh -huh, the answer is, the result is equal to five, is equal to this much, we don't say that anymore. We say it's a statistical distribution, and then the probability of it being at five is this many. And then the probability of it being, five might be the average. Right, and we, we, we develop a spread. So that's how we treat it. Right? There might be other ways. Uh, to cause the dielectrical breakdown, your strain level must be significant enough. Yes, the polymer is pretty flexible. The polymer can develop, can deform like, you know, 20, 30%, 40%. <coughs> So your constituent relationship is nonlinear. This will last it. Yes, we accounted partly for that, for the fully coupled electromechanical simulations. Uh, on the linear theories, finite though, finite deformation. Right. On the linear theories exist, but for the pure mechanical part, we we did account for that in the nonlinear, fully nonlinear viscoelastic. So. But the coupled equations, uh, I'm only aware of. Even for finite settings, it's linear, yes. Electrical phenomenon still linear? Electrical phenomenon is still linear. And I, think there, I do not, I'm not aware of any nonlinear theory. That's kind of, these things are quite new. I don't think there has been a lot of research by different communities to really go much deeper. I mean, purely mechanics, thermal or mechanically, we have highly linear rate dependent theories. We deal with a lot of factors. But in these areas, I think, uh, especially when you multi have multi-physics, the coupling, right? Nonlinearity is hard to characterize. There is just, it's, primarily it's linear theory so far. Okay. Questions from students? Okay. Uh, 
I mean, I have a question. Um, I see you, you see the flexor electricity when you have the, the aluminum hot cross, right? And also in the case when you have aluminum hot cross and the voids, right? in these two cases, you have. So I guess the, the flexor electricity really comes from the, the strain the strain field, right? The non uniform strain field due to the particles and the void. Right? If you don't have particles and if you don't have, then there should be no flexor electricity. Oh, well, no, no, no. If you do not have particles, if you do not have the voids, you still have flexor electricity in the polymer. If you, if you blend it, if you have applied a microscopic uniform definition, otherwise. Well, that's fine. You have to bend it. But if you just do like uniform stretching, you're not going to activate the strength gradient, you're not going to activate the flexor electricity. That's right. Right. And the particles, the voids themselves, they do not have any electrical response. But they make the fields in the polymer much more non-uniform and higher intensity. And that's why you get an enhancement. Right. So that's where the so-called microstructure effect comes in. I, I, I don't know if you... Yeah, probably just question. Well, if it's random, I have to know much difference, but I don't, if, you, if you could, maybe theoretically, or in that simulation, you could have a periodic, if you have it a periodically. The voice. The voice. The, the, the voice, no way that see, because I see the voice, but actually, they, sometimes they form a chain like, you know, right? So like, right, right, right. Well, I would either periodicity or clustering yeah, of both voids and particles. Uh, that's something that you know we have not done. Uh, you, you can systematically verify that, create samples and see how your yeah, clustering patterning would, would, would come out to, to, to play a big role. That's, yes, quite possible. We haven't done that yet. Um, is the application for this just improving Efficiency of like what you mentioned, um, like tables or propulsion. Here. Uh, well, we my funding is from the Air Force, and they are interested in uh, propellants. So, uh, yes, but the implication of this is energy harvesting. For example, if you have, I mean, you can now use vibrations to take advantage of the piezo and flexo electricity to harvest environmental energy. So you can have a, possibly a very small device and maybe embed it somewhere and as you walk or as you take, as the environment vibrates, that can give you, harvest the environmental energy and, and power your small sensors or even potentially medical devices, right? And this is one of those mechanisms. Now, I have a, a head, a colleague, at Georgia Tech, uh, ZL1, who has been developing these nano generators. And he uses piezoelectric materials to, to, to develop uh, nano wires, also to develop very small nano, uh, like, 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 like transducers that would convert vibrations into electrical energy, right? And this gives you another mechanism to do that. So it would be totally different from just you know, energetic materials many other applications. And you don't have to go anywhere near to dielectric breakdown. You, the temp, you don't have to activate the dielectric breakdown or the temperature increase, right? You can s stay within very small magnitudes of deformation and stress and E-field. So, so, so the application could be very different. Speaking of ZL one's work, I think his nano wires were all deflected on the bending. Right. And we had some difficulty <laughs> explaining the results. Maybe the flexor electricity instead of pure the electricity maybe more important. Right. Like actually, recently I came upon one of his papers which he used in which he used the polymer. So I suspect that there might be flexor electricity there. I haven't looked at it in detail. Maybe I'll think about it in the content. And maybe he has some of the effect here. It's possible. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Is it possible to generate, let's say, plasticity 
um, using this phenomena and conversely, if let's say the polymer is in the plasticity regime, does that impact the performance of it? Is it possible you get the polymer into the plastic regime? Mm -hmm. Yes. That would come in to check, make your physics more complicated. The equations are a little bit more complicated, non-linearity, but that could bring in a contribution of, again, the, the mechanical thermal dissipation. Well, the truth is there is a little bit, like I showed. Uh, we did some calculations, and I think ultimately when the load intensity is high, we probably have a small degree of plasticity there. But, the, but I believe the amount of heat, the amount of plasticity generated here is relatively low. The magnitude is relatively low. So, so it's electrically dominated. Now, if I had to consider plasticity as well, then there has to be a lot more development of the, the equations, the algorithms. But, but yeah, plasticity could be, could be important, but under certain conditions. But I would say probably not hugely important here. All right. Thank you very much. And let's uh, thank the speaker. Well, thank you again.